Let me begin by reminding everybody we've got some dates I just need to, re to, to say out here very, very quickly. Tomorrow, uh, Michelle will be doing the sharing and um, uh, I will be assisting. I have a chance to listen to Michelle on April 10th, which is two weeks away. It is Palm Sunday and we're having a special meeting at 1045 to formally um, vote on to accepting or not Michelle as another affiliated uh, community minister. Um, and then we follow with a Palm Sunday service. Easter, we have two services. At 9.30, we're meeting at a rally, a face-to-face, -face, our first face-to-face -face since, since Christmas Eve. And so be face-to-face -face rallies. I expect a small group to be show up, but it was, it's, it's a lot of fun to get a group together. A rally son, as you'll remember, is a quadriplegic, and we have been with, with a rally and her family for years and years and years, especially in the summertime. And so we hope to be doing once a month um, in-house, uh, house church is the old phrase, or house temple or house synagogue from a long, long time ago. We're resurrecting it, if you will. And then we have our regular Easter service at 11. And then on the last, we have Easter plus one. That is the last Sunday in April. And Besa will be sharing, and I will be assisting Besa. So we've got a full boat coming up. And I did want to share with everybody before we begin that I did get my fourth, fourth booster shot uh, two days ago. Um, I got it by accident. I was reading about um, the FDCC, FDA, the CCCC, yeah, whatever it is, saying that they might be making uh, fourth booster shots available. Uh, the transplant team never sent out anything to any of us. So I called the pharmacy and said, should I make an appointment now for the next couple of weeks? They said, why would you wait a couple of weeks? You can get it now. I said, really? They said, yeah. Uh, didn't you get the message? Transplantees and immune suppressed can get them immediately. Well, no, we didn't. So I went over and got the shot and had no reaction. Um, in fact, I didn't have a reaction to any of the shots, but um, I'm just sharing with you. I'm glad to have gotten that. So if any of you are immune suppressed, um, and for those of you who are of a certain age, let me say that delicately, if you are of a certain age, they will be available in a couple of weeks. So I just share that with you for uh, for basic information. Okay, uh, Serge Cruz made it in for a few moments. Serge has um, Serge has been in an interesting thing, by the way. He's working at T-Mobile, and he's got a different job there now. And it is the I don't know if you knew this. A little interesting factoid: um, the T-Mobile store near Westland Mall, Westlake Mall in Hialeah, it's about two blocks away, is the most active. Um, if, if not the most, one of the most active stores for T-Mobile in the entire United States. Yeah, in Hialeah, a couple of blocks from Westlake Mall. It is, they, it's so busy, they have four assistant managers. That's how busy it is, and a huge staff to take care of everybody. From the time they open to the time they close late at night, it is packed every day, seven days a week in Hialeah, for what it's worth. Okay. All righty. Yes, we're all family now. Yes, including Nick. All righty, moving along here, let me begin uh, this morning by, by saying something that I've been sharing with my classes a lot lately, and Bobby missed this because I've really been pounding it. Um, <laughs> Nick, you're going to get pied if you keep this up. All right, I want to share with my classes a couple of things that, um, that, uh, that seem to me to be a major, major issue in all religions. It's probably true in politics as well, but especially in religion. There are two things that are absolutely annoying because they mess things up tremendously. Number one is the collapse of timelines. By that, I mean, when you talk to people in any religion, it's like everything happened now. People don't realize things happen over a long period of time. And so um, when you look at, at, when you talk to traditional Christians, there seems to be no understanding that doctrine as they know it and espouse it took a long while to get there. People just assume that immediately, of course, there was a doctrine of the Trinity, that of course there was a this, of course there was a that, and of course there was not. And so one of the biggest problems I have in, in teaching religion is saying people think they have their timelines. You have to get timelines. They didn't happen overnight. 
So when we get to Christianity, for instance, I spend a whole class on looking at the second century of Christianity, showing it was there that Christian diversity got rooted. It was there where it all fell apart. In fact, it was not all, it was never all one to begin with. And that's where we're going to visit, revisit again this morning. So this idea that, we, that, that when I was growing up, the idea was we were all in Christianity, one big happy family, this solid trunk, until that those Easterners split from the mighty West and had that orthodox thing, which nobody really understands, you know, but they're there. And then, of course, those damn Protestants had to come along in the 1500s and totally ruin it. Um, the reality was there was never one solid trunk. Today, if you study Christianity at all, it has from the beginning been a mangrove. Forget the trunk idea, one solid tree, it's a mangrove. It has always been a mangrove. And so we study that at, at great length in Christianity. And so I offer five bonus questions on a section on the section called um, it's called um, Lost Gospels. They're not lost at all, they've just been renamed. So timelines, timelines become an absolutely essential thing. We'll look at that today. Um, and by the way, all religions have this. I don't know if you're aware of this. There's the famous Book of the Be Dead in Tibetans and in um, in Tibetan Buddhism. It's not it's not old. It's only been around since the seventh or eighth century. Everybody thought it went back thousands of years. It's not old. The idea of Dalai Lamas being resurrected, uh, uh, being um, reincarnated. That isn't old either. I bet you didn't know this, but most lamas were married and had kids, and the head of the monastery was passed on to the eldest son. The idea that suddenly you had to have chaste and, and non-kids, non-children bearing lamas is only from the 14 and 1500s. We assume all this stuff happened since the beginning. None of this stuff happened since the beginning. At least the Hindus are honest. They will tell you it took a long time for the Bhagavad Gita to finally get completed. They were very honest. It takes it took several hundred years of editing. They're honest about that. The Mahabharata took several hundred years of editing, and they're honest about that. But at least they get that they say we had timelines, and it's, it was a constant, constant editing and re-editing and retelling of the story. And they're honest, and they'll be honest about that. Other groups are not. They, they kind of hide things. I bet you didn't know that the Quran did not pop right out of, um, out of um, uh, Muhammad. Muhammad had these revelations in the desert, but he didn't write. So when he came back from the desert, he got scribes. One scribe, he dictated what he believed the angel Gabriel told him. Then to another scribe, he recorded his own feelings about all of this, his own ruminations and recollections and what you do with it. So he kept them separate. When he dies, people then, a small a committee, will edit for a couple of years what ultimately becomes the Quran. But we're not told who is on the committee, and we're not told who told who left out what and why. And you know, everybody brings something to the table, and when something gets edited out, I want to know why. I would like to know how they made that decision. So, you know, timelines get collapsed, and you need to know that. You need to know that. And that's true with Christianity. Timelines get slapped. And the second thing that's a mess is geography. Nobody seems to get geography. My class was, a, was about wowed um, when I showed up the map. Now, Bobby Vance's class got this, but not well as, as yours did because I messed it up. And one of my students showed me how to do this. Let's take a look at a couple of maps to again refresh us with what my class simply could not, they get, they simply never understood this. And they said, this is embarrassing. I had all these students who go to church who said, this, 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 this is totally different. We've had Jesus at the wrong place, the wrong time. And now we understand what the issues are with the virgin birth. So let's share a screen here very quickly. Let's refresh our minds here. Let's share a screen. Okay. We're going to go down here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back. We're going to go back and we're going to take a look at, just to refresh our memories, so I'm going to put a new screen up. Let's see if I can find it here. I got it in the wrong place. Hold it. 
Okay, let's uh, let's just uh, look at this very very quickly to remind ourselves that maps are important. The Galilee <coughs> up here, this little town rural of Nazareth, and up here is the big city of Sepphoris right here. And here's the Sea of Capernaum where Jesus moved when he was 30. This dusty little village is separated from Judea by this whole area of Samaria. So if you want to get through Samaria, you have to go all the way down here to the Jordan River Valley and make it down through here, down through here, down through here, all the way over through here, up through here. Then you have to go up, 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 and down into, here you go, Bethlehem. Bethlehem is 62 miles. How are you going to take a pregnant woman, and go 62 miles, and say, hey, we need to go 62 miles to where my family's uh, generations are for a census? When you look at the maps, you see that, oh, how are you going to have a, a pregnant woman walk 62 miles, and how long is that going to take? Jesus spent 99% of his ministry here not down here and i sent you all the um the differences between judea and galilee it is the difference between bavaria uh think of, of, of doug's bavaria and munich versus berlin holy mackerel you're going to get two entirely urban areas entirely urban geographies ways of doing things am i not right doug mm -hmm. munich is about as different from berlin as um as jerusalem is from the C capernaum Am I right? Yep. Different. It, it's, the accents are even different. Am I not right? Very much so. Okay. So I'm just saying. Ron, Ron uh, and I will. Uh, Ron and I, with our spouses, will experience that in two weeks. So we're not going to be here in two weeks. We'll be in Berlin. Oh, send us pictures. And by the <laughs> way, your picture, your picture will be showing up in uh, on Wednesday in the uh, Thursday rather in the weekly. We see all the red dust from um, from the Sahara. Talk yeah. about geography. Okay, so it's really important. Now, the next map I want to show you is something that probably nobody has ever seen. So let's go back. It's it's out there, but let me put it to you. Let me put it Christianity. Let me go up here to show you. Ah, here we go. Now. Here is network error. Don't do this to me. Why are you doing this to me? Reload the player. Ah, okay. No, 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 no. Oh, for heaven's sake. Okay, does that mean I have to buy this? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. If you can see some of this, a network. Reset the page. Huh? Reset the whole page. Uh, like Reset the whole page. All right, how do you want me to do that, Nick? Right there. Okay. Now, here, nope, didn't work. Didn't yeah. work. Okay, I may have to, to, let's see if this will work. Here, yes, see, if there's, um, I don't know why that did that. Hold it, let me try something else. Let me, let me try something else. One more time, see if I can work it this way. Uh, no, I won't load, I'm sorry, there we go. Uh, no, I have to buy it, I guess. Um, oh, let's see, okay. Here is, uh, it's just not working. I guess I have to buy it. Let's see if I can try this one more time. If you take a look at this very, very quickly, take a look at Jerusalem, take a look at Alexandria, Damascus, Babylon, Antioch, Rome, and Carthage. These are areas that ultimately will hear the Jesus story. But when you look at this and see from the very beginning, oh, come on, do this, do this. I did not realize this was going to be an issue. We can still see the map. I mean, if, if you don't need to play the video, the map is still visible. Not as great, but, right, but, what, but what happens is, is when you see this, and I'm sorry about this, when you start here, it fills in each of the places bit by bit by bit along the way to show you how it leaves 
Judea and the Galilee after the Great War, and it begins to branch out village by village by village and up and up and up and up. And I didn't realize you had to buy this doggone thing because it's really, really worth it to see how it goes and goes and goes. And you, as it goes along the bottom here, you can see, and I'll see how I get that. You can see how each little area, and they're small. The villages and houses are small. And remember that the message gets started small people sharing the people talking. And remember, these were not churches as the way you may think of church buildings. They meet in synagogues. The original meeting places were synagogues and people's homes. Mm -hmm. And outside of the Galilee, you're not talking synagogues, maybe a few, but the rest of them are house churches. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted you to see is geographically, mm -hmm. not numbers, but how people began to talk and how people began to spread. And so, um, as I said, this is, um, this is one of those things that uh, it's important to get an idea about. And I'll see if I can get a, um, a way to uh, deal with that, uh, that so you can all see it. Now, um, let me go back here. And I want to show you um, in another thing here, right here, talking about um, the splits and the under misunderstanding of history is right here. I want you to go down here to Jewish Christians right here. Let me pull this up so I can get my, my um, right here. Jewish Christians continued to worship in synagogues together with contemporary Jews for, for centuries. Again, timelines. People assume, and this is before the gospels are written, people assume that as soon as Jesus dies, his followers immediately separate from the other Jews and immediately become quote unquote Christian. That's not the way it happened, but that's the way I was taught growing up. What you have is you have synagogues and all synagogues are not the same. They're not the same today. You go to reform synagogues and reform synagogues will vary as different as you can get. Temple Beth Am here in Kendall is like a cathedral. Temple Judea, five miles away, is, is uh, one quarter the size and is a very, very active, um, and as the rabbis say, it is very easily worked with because you get to know everybody. The other one is this huge, huge congregation. It's like a, like a, like a cathedral. Two very different styles of worship, two very different styles of rabbis, two very different styles of being. Why would anybody assume all synagogues are the same? I have no idea. All mosques are not the same. All churches aren't the same. Here, Jewish Christians continue to worship in synagogues together with contemporary Jews for centuries. That throws everybody. Now, one of the things that cracks me up, enjoy this, the first centuries of belief in Jesus were characterized by great uncertainty. Does that sound like 2022? Hello, look at that. Does that sound like 2022? Let me read this this way. These centuries of belief in Jesus are characterized by great uncertainty. Does that sound familiar? And religious creativity. Does that sound familiar? All right. Groups of believers, think of today as well, coalesced into proto-factions of like-minded individuals and then into factions. Does that sound like Miami? Does it sound like Berlin? Uh, I mean, or does it sound like Munich? Uh, Doug has a Doug is in Munich, which is a town which is heavily. Roman Catholic in name, of course, not many people go to mass, but it's heavily Roman Catholic in name, but right smack downtown is, um, is uh, St. Mateus Kirka, St. Matthew's Church, was, uh, which is a, uh, used to be, I don't know what it is today, was a very strong Protestant congregation, right in the middle of, um, of Munich. Right. And, uh, but it is not like its fellow Protestant congregations in Berlin. In Berlin, Brandenburg, the congregations are very, very liberal, my guess is the Congregation of Munich is a conservative Protestant congregation. It's still Protestant, but very conservative, would be my guess. Uh, Nuremberg is caught probably between the conservatism of Bavaria and the liberalism of, um, of uh, Berlin Brandenburg, and so it's probably be, could be listed as moderate as things go, would be my guess. Uh, Nuremberg was as part of uh, probably the only Protestant city, quote unquote, in all of Munich. Of, of, of all of uh, Bavaria. Oh, Bavaria. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so look at this. 
I think this is right. Groups of believers coalesced into proto factions and the like mind ended then into factions. That sounds like us to dig. Look at this. The degree of doctrinal cohesion of these groups is unknown. Is there any cohesion in all souls? No. The cohesion is we don't demand doctrine. That's the cohesion we have. The cohesion is we do not demand a specific dogma. The degree of doctrinal cohesion of these groups is unknown. Now look at this. As attested by text, confusion and chaos were rampant. <laughs> it sounds like the United States. This is from 2,000 years ago, folks. <laughs> I'm reading a document about the history 2,000 years ago. Ha! <laughs> And it looks like the United States and the rest of Christianity, the rest of the world. Um, every so often, I'll have a student that gets very upset that we're not presenting what they feel is the appropriate way of, of presenting Christianity. And I point out there are 300 groups of, of, of denominations in the United States. I say, what are you going to tell the other 299 that there's all wrong and you're the only one who's right? There are 40,000 Christian denominations in the world. 40,000. So when you say confusion and chaos were rampant, I mean, you have to enjoy, this is from 2,000 years ago. Looks like somebody has come from another planet and was documenting religion in 2022 on planet Earth. Now, both early Christianity and early rabbinic Judaism were far less orthodox and less theologically homogeneous than they are today. OK. Um, according to a historian, a Jewish historian, the separation of Christianity from Judaism was a process, not an event. It's not like, boom, suddenly that's it. Everybody split. Didn't happen. And if, uh, to be very honest with you, if you have I hope you have a good sense of humor about this. If you put a bunch of Unitarian uh, ministers, very liberal Protestants, and Reformed rabbis together, you're not going to be able to know who's who. If everybody's sitting around in jeans and T-shirts or all sitting around in suits, you're going to be hard-pressed to tell who the Reformed rabbi is, the Unitarian minister or the liberal Protestant. I remember when the rabbi from Ormond Beach and I used to swap pulpits. A lot of times, this is, this is 25 years ago, we did a lot of mixed weddings together. And I would wear a suit and he would wear a suit and everybody would get mixed up who the rabbi was. Oftentimes they thought I was the rabbi and, 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 and he would just roar and he said, actually, I'm the rabbi. And they'd say, he sounds like more like the rabbi. And he said, he's the minister of the United Church. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was a riot. I mean, so you get groupages today and linkages that defy labels, that defy labels. Okay. Um, Let's see, where's this right here? Uh, down here at the end, according to Boyeran, Judaism and Christianity were part were of one complex religious families, twins and a womb. All right. Um, according to Robert Goldberg, it is increasingly accepted among scholars that at the end of the first century, there were not yet two separate religions called Judaism and Christianity. So let's be clear in timelines. It is a long, long process. Let's be clear in maps. Geography makes a difference. Now, you know that today, but it makes a big, big, big difference um, if you take a look at the world back then. Now, when we get to, um, when I start teaching a class on Christianity, one of the things I did is I said, and, and Bobby Vance will remember this, is if you want to know in one minute how Christianity got so diverse and so, so very, very quickly different, go like this. Imagine Pat is living in that rural area of Tampa. Um, uh, Dubois is up there in Wisconsin. Doug is in a minor part of Vienna. And, and, and Ron is in Bentleyville. And each of you have a different accent, and each of you have a different culture, and each of you have different rituals, and each of you hear the Jesus story. Each of you will hear that story the way you hear it in your own language, 
assimilate that to your language and reinterpret it in your language and in your in your rituals and in your culture. So that makes sense. Of course it does. If you get that, you're going to understand how Christianity becomes so incredibly diverse by the end of the second century. If you get that, imagine Pat is re ready for this. She is in Barcelona. Imagine Dubois is in Madrid. Imagine Doug is uh, in Northern Italy. Imagine Ron is in Rome. Pat is in Thessalonica, Greece. Barbara Young is, um, is, is in the East Coast of, of what we now call Turkey. Maureen is in the Eastern part of Syria. Just imagine this 2000 years ago with the incredibly different accents and worldviews. Each of you will interpret the story that you hear in your own language. Now, this works very easily for my, my Hispanic students because they get the fact, you can say Hispanic, but the cultures have nothing in common. They get that very quickly. And I don't know if you know anything about Hispanics, but the, but the pronunciation of words is very different. The vocabulary is very different. My wife is from Colombia. Venezuela is next door. The vocabulary is different. The pronunciation is different. Now, I'll give you a quick, this is fun, but I'll give you an example. For instance, there is from one of the islands, the kind of language will go like this. Comita. Eh. Comita. Eh. It's very, very, very um, um, uh, a, type of, a type of Cuban. Comita. Eh. And my wife has a fit. She goes, it's como estas. Not comita. Como estas. And so you get this. And my, my Hispanic students get that very well. You get somebody from Chile. And they'll say, my heavens, you know, we have nothing to do with Peru. And Peru is right next to Ecuador, and Ecuador is right next to Colombia. Very different languages, very different worldviews, very different rituals. Very, very different. Islanders. Have you ever been to the islands? You get kind of a similar kind of sounding, but it's not really. I mean, if you've been to the islands, you're going to find Haiti is not, is not, is not uh, the, the DR. And you're going to find uh, everybody has a patois. Everybody has a patois, but they're different. I mean, you know, um, and to show you, it, it's funny how the islands work. I remember I went to a Caribbean islands uh, a meeting. Um, my students asked me to go. And the Jamaicans and the Trinis were going at it good naturedly, like there's no tomorrow. It mm. dawned on me, listen to me how dumb I am. I, how, you know, how I ever got a doctor, I have no idea. I can't believe how dumb I am. So I thought Trinidad was right next to Jamaica because they were going at it all the time. And I thought they were soccer rivals. Was I shocked to know that Trinidad is off the coast of Venezuela and like a thousand miles away from Jamaica. I had no idea they were that far apart. Yet the way the, but they, and they were totally different cultures. Trinidad is 40% is Hindu, 40% African, Chinese and English. I mean, you talk about a mix. Jamaica has got, you're going to love this, folks. A lot of Scots heritage, English heritage, and a ton of African heritage. And the blending is unbelievable. I have to share this. I do this all the time because it's so amazing. I can't tell my students, stuff. don't judge somebody's I, what they are by what you see. And I had these two first cousins from Jamaica. They could have been models. They were gorgeous and a riot. Six foot one, I had them stand on each side of me. And I said to the class, all right, you got Pharaoh Khufu here between the two of them. Other than the fact I look ancient, do we have anything in common? The class roared. They said, absolutely not. I said, you're wrong. We're all 20% Scots. They said, what? I said, you don't know anything about Jamaica. They said, the guys were laughing. They high-fived it. They said, you don't know anything, folks. It's true. We've all got Scots heritage. In the class is going, that's not possible. Then people started doing their DNA. And then they a big, big surprise to everybody. So you go. And so I'm saying, you know, you take a look at, if you get this, you're going to understand Christianity evolving very quickly with very different rituals, very different points of view. And so you get a Semitic idea that God is one. But then you're going to smack dab into other religions that simply never had an idea that God is one. There's too much work for one God to do. So you're going to find all kinds of areas with all kinds of religions with, with pantheons. 
Greeks, Romans, of course, borrowed theirs, but take a look at all the Hindu gods and goddesses trying to show you that one god has many examples of how much they can do. You look at all of this, and so you get the idea, one god, that can't be possible. Then you're going to get the number three cropping up all over the place, and you're getting get rituals. Of course, if you did a study of, 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 of virgin births, it always comes as a shock. Okay, yes, Greater London has dozens of different accents. Yes, of course. Um, I remember um, in St. John's Wood, now, um, my good friend, may his soul rest in peace, was at St. John's, St. John's, excuse me, St. John's Church of England, St. John's. And um, St. John's Wood, by the way, I hope you have a sense of humor. Uh, St. John's, uh, St. John's was where the wealthy ton kept their ladies. I'm putting this politely. <laughs> kept their ladies who were not their wives. Now, it, then it evolved into this very, very, very exclusive place. And now it is, a, it is an entirely representative of the entire what was the British Empire. Name an ethnic group where the British Empire was, and it's now in St. John's Wood. And so you walk down the street and you will get all kinds of accents. Ron, you're looking, you're looking confused. What? No, I'm not confused. I'm, I'm just thinking um, ethnic groups of St. John's Wood. <clears throat> and um, when, I I there, have, when it, I was there, I saw Indians, Pakistanis. Um, you have Greeks and Poles there as well. Greeks oh. and Poles. Yeah. OK, I didn't see those, but, I, 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 but I'm just saying it was just fascinating to see this, this sure. thing. And John's church, by the way. Oh, I, I, wish, I wish you could have been there. He has a Sunday service, and half the service is from Africa. So you would see, oh, I, this is so funny, and I love this. Remember seeing the wedding when uh, the younger son got married to, um, to, the, to the woman in, in the latest wedding, uh, I forget, Harry. Harry gets married. You saw those women, those hats. What is it with British women in these hats? All right. So in John's church, these women with these hats, and then you see all of these African women, and they're, they're, they're colorful um, headdresses and colorful this it was an absolute mishmash of different cultures it was magnificent a flowing thing of color and just fabric and everything and um so i'm just sharing with you that um if you get this and you get the difference you're going to find that the christian story gets all over the place um and a classic two classic examples of this are when we do communion at all souls did you know our communion is really bread and cup it is the very, very ancient Canaanite idea of you have simple bread and you have simple cup and you offer it as a meal. Now, John Dominic Crossan, a very famous priest, said Christians have got all wrong. They focus on the Last Supper. Let's point out, and my, by the way, we learned this in seminary, nobody remembers what the Last Supper was. Nobody was there taking notes. You know, people don't get this. Nobody knew it was going to be the Last Supper. I don't know if any of you ever thought about that, but nobody knew it was going to be the Last Supper. It was a time of terrible stress. We're not even sure if it was a Passover meal. And by the way, you do realize that the thing of Da Vinci on the table, we, they did not sit at tables 2,000 years ago. It was something that was off the floor about a foot, and you reclined, you reclined lying down around the table. You dipped with your hand. Like Bedouins, if you ever see Bedouins in the tent and they're sitting around, you dip with your hand. That's the way they did a supper then. And if it had been a Last Supper, let me tell you why Da Vinci was wrong. If it had been a Last, if it had been a Passover meal rather, if it had been a Passover meal, everybody better win there. Dogs, cats, kids, women, the whole bit. A Passover supper involved everybody. A Seder involved everybody. So what we're getting is a medieval idea of what a Last Supper should be. We're not even sure whether it was a Passover meal or not. If it was a Passover meal, Da Vinci's got it all wrong. If it was just a supper, he's got it all because they didn't sit at a table. Um, it's a big debate, Danny. Um, half, the, half the scholars say it was a Passover Seder. The other half say it wasn't. Can you hear me? Yes, Kathy. Yes. Kathy? I think we lost her. 
and not on all on one side of the table. Yes, that's another point. Yeah, you'd be all around the table. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah. So who are you looking at? Yes, Kathy, you're trying to say something. Oh, Kathy. No, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Someone tried calling me, and I'm trying to tell them I'm busy with you. I apologize. No problem, Kathy. Come on, you know us. No problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if it was a supper, first of all, if it was the last supper, nobody's going to remember that. And if you actually read the Bible text, it's a little bit different with each one because their memory is different. Number two, can I make it very clear they did not use diamond encrusted and jewel encrusted gold chalices? Can I make that clear? Where are you going to get a bunch of Galilean peasants who can barely afford the clothes they've got holding a gold encrusted diamond solid gold jewel encrusted chalice? Good Lord. No, Holy Grail. No, 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 no. Sorry. I get nuts about this. Can you imagine going back? Listen to this. I have more fun with this. You go back two months later and you say, hey, do you remember that group of peasants who were here? Yeah. Do you have any of the utensils we used? They were special. It's like somebody saying in a diner. What? Are you out of your mind? We use the same stuff all over again. What do you mean special? I mean, seriously, people, people take a very simple meal. And I get what human beings do to this, but by the way, it took a while again for this to suddenly become this divine holy mystery. You go into other areas, you just can't have a meal. Other areas process this differently. So you see a huge split then between those of us who tend to be Jewish in our understanding of a meal, simple bread and cup, and offering it that, and by the way, again, talking about timelines, what were the first services that they had that were involving meals? Agape meals. Everybody forgets that. Even my most traditional Christian students say, oh yeah, Paul keeps talking about uh, agapes. What were they? I said an agape meal was everybody had brought food and they had a blessing and shared food together because they were poor. And they met on the on sundown Friday to sundown Saturday somewhere. And then and they had a meal and had, and had a chance to share their faith and what they thought. But it begins as an agape meal, a love fest. Agape meant love. It wasn't any of this, of, the, of what you see of word and sacrament, incense, high, holy, this, and all the rest of that. And by the way, as I'm ranting, let me point out something that, that, that comes as a big shock as well. When you see Lutheran, high church Lutherans and Anglicans and Roman Catholics hold up the wafer high so everybody to look at it. Do you know when that first happened? 1215 in Paris, because it was decided on the spur of the moment by the priest that nobody could see what was going on. I'm serious. The original holding up of the wafer was so people could see in the back what was going on. Yes, optics. The reason you had bells in the Roman Catholic Church originally was to note, let people know what part of the service they were in. Why? Because nobody read. 95% of the congregations were illiterate. So you had optics. You had things you could see. You had bells you could hear. You could have statues you could look at. You could have stained glass windows that told you stories. Is that making sense to everybody? It was very practical. It's not till later that you get all of this holy, holy, holy. They were very practical things to begin with. Now, if you saw my doctor's gown, you would say, oh, Claus, oh, my. The only reason Protestant ministers wore gowns to begin with is because most of them were in the university. That's all they had. And the reason they were fancy is because it kept them warm. There was no heat in the universities in the winter. And so you wore these big, heavy gowns and these, these fancy hoods to keep you warm. So when you see all this stuff, people think, oh. And I remember when Christians said to me, you are wearing a stole the yoke of Christ. I said, well, it didn't begin that way. What do you mean? I said, it originally began that when Christianity made, made um, when Constantine made Christianity legal, 
and, and, and welcome Christian clergy, they then, are you ready for this, began to wear a purple sash, meaning they were of the emperor. Originally, it was a, simply a purple sash, which was kind of a na 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 na. We are of the emperor now, and you're not. If you ever looked at what Christ, if Roman Catholic and Anglican and Lutheran, a lot of Lutheran clergy wear, did you ever notice the the chasuble is a poncho? Did you ever look at that? It's a poncho. Of course it is. Why? Because the alb was the garment of the people. The poncho went over it. And as styles changed in the empire, the clergy kept what they were used to wearing. It was not considered unique until several hundred centuries, several hundred centuries later. It was wearing the everyday attire. And as you could imagine, somebody, some people, if they had money, had more expensive everyday attire than somebody else. Now, um, I hope you'll enjoy this. Um, I have an absolute livid uh, thing about somebody was keeping track of the amount of money that some of our famous YouTube clergy are spending on sneakers. Did you see that? It's posted on, uh, on uh, there are clergy who are spending $1,500 to wear sneakers as they preach on Sunday morning with designers, designer jeans and designer shirts wearing several, a couple of thousand dollars worth of accoutrement is they're preaching the gospel to the of the poor. Lovely. So you need to know all this stuff has been around a long, long time. So we get back to the beginning. It starts simply. Jesus was poor. We clear about that. His followers, most of them were poor. Of course, you'll always get a few people of money that will follow. And he dies. And then his story gets told and people remember things. And how those things are remembered and how people gather will then tell us how people remember Jesus and how the gospels get written. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. If you start out with then the difference between Galilee and Judea, you're off and running. Also, remember the pesky Samaria. This Jesus gives water to the Samaritan woman at the well, sticking his eye into those in Judea. Who were the 10 lepers and who was the only one who turned back the Samaritan? And Jesus says, is there, is there, is there nobody else turning around to say, thank you? Just this foreigner, the Samaritan sticks. And then remember this good Samaritan, one of the most famous parables in the gospels. A Levite passes by, a priest passes by, and who's the only one who picks up the beaten man and carries him bloody and smelly and all? Let's not forget a Samaritan. So they will hear the Jesus story, and they will begin to tell the Jesus story. And there'll be a few in Judea as well. And then you're going to be hearing the Essenes and followers of John the Baptist, and it's going to be a small group's telling the story as they know it, and they remember Jesus himself. If you're going to get that, then you're off and running. Geography makes a difference. Accents make a difference. And uh, Ron, now, Ron and Doug, by the way, are in countries where this is acute. Northern Germany speaks Hochdeutsch. Ich bin ich dich nicht. Ich, ich. And then you get ish, nish, and the stuff in southern Germany. Very different. My friend John Slater had to do, had to do he came from a place in northern, uh, northern England, and his accent was thick. This, he said he's embarrassed to tell people this, but he went to school to learn how to speak English the way they speak in London. And that, I, at that, at his, and I don't know if they do that anymore, but back in the 60s, that was not uncommon for many of the clergy of the Church of England if they wanted to go to the London area. Yeah, that's that still happens. Oh, it's not just clergy. <clears throat> a lot of people want to, you know, to lose the Northern accent in, in order to uh, progress and, and you know, be understood and be accepted. The same thing with Southern US. <clears throat> classes to lose their Southern accent. 
Oh yes, and I, 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 the Southern accent art. I you practice it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The time I was in the back seat of the car and we stopped at someplace in North Carolina, my the guy said "yow ow," and I was like seven. I said, "Mom, what is he speaking? What is that language?" That's when Emily went wild and let loose with me of several words and basically said, "Shut up." I didn't understand what he was saying. And then she talked back in the same language. And this was a mother. I didn't know what she was talking about. I thought she was suddenly foreign. I mean, you know, so I'm just saying language makes a big, a big impact. So you get language, you get styles. Uh, yeah, you are out of oil. Yes. And she said, actually, yeah, y'all, all, yes. And it also implied, Maureen, do you want me to ch lift up the hood and check the oil in your car as well? That was implied two things. So I'm just saying accents are important. The way you dress is important. The way you see things is important. And so all of that will impact. And now you can see right off the bat how you're going to get Christianities and why there remain Christianities. Um, I remember there was uh, somebody, and I'm looking at the time here, there's somebody I need to mention, um, speaking of Germany, Adolf von Harnack was a very famous church uh, historian in the, um, in the uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, he was even too, too liberal for the Evangelical Church of the Union, which was very, very liberal back then. And he argued Christianity will irrevocably change when it lost its, its Jewish roots. He said, as long as we had Jewish influence in Christianity, you saw Jesus as a human. You saw Jesus as a teacher. He pointed out that Mark's gospel saw Jesus as human. There was no virgin birth in the gospel and no physical resurrection. Jesus came across as somebody who wept, somebody who got mad, somebody who was very real and very human. And he said, once that gets lost, then you can see very easily how you go into cultures in which you get the, the very, very famous um, um, Oh, that's true too, Maureen. We'll mention that later on. That's very, very true too. There will be women pastors into the second and 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 in and in some of the churches into the third century, but that that's a whole other issue. We'll deal with that too. But you're going to get the idea that that now Jesus can't cannot be cannot be a human. God, yes, but a human, no. And so you're going to get this whole thing of the Hercules uh, complex, where you're going to find that in the only two stories we have of the virgin birth, the idea is it's very, very clear you have a human mother. The story of these is you have a human mother, but those who cannot process the idea that somebody this important was merely human. So you go to other areas which have dealt with gods and goddesses, and that's the whole culture is just oozing with this, this influence. The idea that you could have a a carpenter's son, you can't be serious. That's all he was? That doesn't make sense. You can't compute that. There's no way you can compute that. But he was born of a woman. So then you get the, the whole Hercules idea. Does anybody remember who Hercules' mother was? Nobody remembers her. Nobody. Her name was Alcimena. I tell my students, here's the way you can relate to it. Imagine you're on South Beach. And Al Semen is a hottie. And, Hercu and, and, and Zeus transforms himself as being a hunk like lifeguard, and they have a moment. The class loves that. that. That they get. That they get. And I said, they have a moment. The result of which is while, while Zeus has gone back to wherever he goes, the result is two things his wife, and everybody goes, his wife? Uh, yes, he's married. They said, oh, no. I said, oh, yes, he's married and his wife is furious. Meanwhile, poor Al Semena gives birth to da -da -da -da, Hercules, who's not really a god, but he's not really a human either. If you get that, then you're going to get where Christianity then has to have, for those people who cannot have a human being, you go off and, well, we've got somewhere in our, in, our, in our panoply of theologies and dogmas a whole idea of if you can't, if he's not going to be a god, well, then at least we can make him, you know, like Hercules. Now, I'm using very simple English, but you get the idea. 
Now, of course, over a period of time, it comes very complex, as you can imagine, but you get the idea as you're off and running. Meanwhile, people like me get left in the dust, and I would have been one of those rabbis who very much would have wanted to stay for, for several centuries, who would have argued Jesus was a teacher and somebody who was inspired, and therefore, um, uh, you know, um, uh, keep on with, with that approach. But that will be left behind as the message goes to other areas and other areas and other areas where one God just did not make any sense. And I mean that nicely too. I'm, not, I'm just saying that it was, it, I mean that very nicely. Now, um, uh, you probably are sick of hearing this, but you, then you'll understand how the fact that I got ordained. By the way, I've met some of my colleagues from seminary and I told the story and they were infuriated that they could not get away with this. When I was asked the first question, do you believe in the Trinity? And my immediate response was, which one? And it was dead silence. I said, you mean 325 when it was amended in the 380s? Do you mean figuratively, historically, symbolically, literally? I don't know what you mean by the question. There was dead silence. And the chairman of the committee said, we have never ever in our history had anybody major in early church history. Um, they looked at the rest of the committee and says, if you're going to ask Kenneth a question in theology like this, you better understand the question you're asking before you ask it to him. Dead silence. Then they moved on to something totally different. And so my colleague said to me, you didn't have to answer that? I said, they didn't know what they meant by it. So, um, um, yeah, he, although Jesus was not a Hercules, he still must have been very powerful. But here it gets to be interesting. What I don't understand, and I did this, I did this a couple of Sundays ago. You get shaman, you get Taoism starts with healers. Starts 2,500 years ago with healers. Other religions, very powerful healers. Jesus heals, and oh my God, you can't do that. That doesn't make sense. And I never understood why other people can get away with being healers, but somehow Jesus can't in liberal circles. Um, you get some, there's a very, very famous healer whose name I had last time, I have to look it up again. Um, uh, in, in the first century, he was famous for healing. That was perfectly fine. Hop, Hopney the circle drawer and his two sons, Rabbi and his two sons, very popular in Jesus' own lifetime. Hopney the circle drawer, famous, they heal, no problem. But you mentioned Jesus did healing and everybody has a fit. Healing is, is means that you've got some connection, some, some way to deal with um, those who are feeling whatever ailment. And let us not forget that old, old saying that probably predates, predates millennia. What did I do so wrong to deserve this? You ever ask that question? What did I ever do so wrong to deserve this? And you're wondering, why are you asking that? But you ask it anyway. And so if you are somehow feeling cursed and bad, and you're feeling very sick, somebody touching you that you deeply respect can have a serious impact. And I'm not talking magic. Now, when I was in seminary, and I got to watch the time, um, I remember uh, taking a class. They said, never underestimate the importance, and this, is, of course, was meant appropriately. Please, let's get that clear, appropriately. Let us never underestimate, but that's, but that's not necessarily, yeah, but you, Maureen, let's, uh, I don't want to downplay this. In some cases, yes, but never underestimate the power of somebody touching you or holding your hand that you respect and, and, and you're feeling badly. And, and when, you, when somebody says that meant a lot to me, they mean it. That meant a lot um, that, that, you know, that meant, that meant a lot to me. Now you all, maybe some of you think this is, but I can't tell you how many people I have met over the years. This is of course, before COVID when, um, when they would be seriously ill in the hospital and, um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not talking about this kind of thing. I'm not talking, I'm talking about something very genuine. I'm not talking about the frauds. We know all about the frauds and everything else. We know about that. But I can't tell you many people I've seen and people even who said to me, I don't believe in prayer. So let me tell you what I did. 
I hope you'll like this. I said, how about some strong words, some good words? And I get to look like, okay, what do you mean? I said, let me hold your hand. And I said, strength, patience, some hope, a little humor, and know you're not alone. Just holding a hand. That can have more power than you might believe. I didn't magically change anybody's life. Didn't magically do anything. But for a moment, a person would feel that somebody really, really genuinely cared about them and did not want money, did not want anything. They just genuinely cared about them. If you've ever been sick in the hospital, how many times do doctors look at you? The real carers are, are nurses if, they, if they're not overloaded. Right now, they're overloaded. And do you remember that story I read about the Jamaican woman who cleaned the, um, who cleaned the rooms? If you haven't seen that, look at my thing on healing. And the Jamaican woman came over and saw this woman, and she said, you are more than the sickness in that body. And would sit with this woman quietly. And the only one who paid any attention to it, because everybody else was too busy. So I get, as skeptical as I am, how things can happen when you least expect it. And I'm not talking heal, and I'm not talking you shall rise. And somebody has a little ear implant, and they get up, and it's all done by stuff like that. I'm talking about genuineness, genuineness, authenticity, genuine caring. And as I said, for those who don't like prayer, I said, how about some good words? I hope you like that. Good words. And so um, I just share that with you. So I don't take the healing thing um, as, um, as, uh, as skeptically as others. Um, I think today, and I'll, 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 I don't want to sound like I'm sermonizing. I think today, um, it, it's always been this case. It's not today. Most people... Who do we have to care for us? If we've got a couple of good friends or family, we're lucky. We're lucky. I've been around a long time now. I have been around longer than three quarters of a century. That is scary. And I'm telling you, a lot of people don't have a lot of people to care about them. Now that is an observation. And so when somebody cares genuinely, um, genuinely, it is special. Now Maureen just said something and I'll, I'll stop here. And I don't know if you, I hope you agree with me. Maybe you don't. I was asked several times this week and they said, you know, a lot of, a lot of congregations really not, are not sure what why they are what they are. And I said, how would you describe all souls? I said, I would describe all souls and Saturday and Sunday and the group that follows during the week as a group of people who come from very, very, very different backgrounds, very different beliefs, but who genuinely enjoy being with each other to learn from each other and share with each other. And I said, um, if anything, my role is simply to be a glue that gets things together. But I learn from as much from my, my, my congregation as I hope they learn from me. So there is a mutuality here of how do we learn and hold each other without an agenda, without an agenda, except caring. Because there's, there's not a lot of genuine caring around here without the, oh, but. So... Um, that's, that's what I think uh, what, what we're about. Genuine caring, learning, uh, going through this mess. And um, I think that's, 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 uh, that's about as good as you can get, honestly. Now, um, next class, um, um, where did she go here? Karen Armstrong starts with a comment about mm -hmm. Jesus is an enigma. Let's have some fun with that. That always surprises everybody too. Jesus is an enigma. Now, as we leave here, look at these different backgrounds. Um, 
I know we've got some some Roman Catholics, some Methodists, um, uh, some um, atheists in background. Uh, we've got um, some more Methodists. Um, I'm guessing some Baptists. Lots of Jewish folks. Um, we've got uh, Armenian Orthodox and Orthodox from Russia, Ukraine. Um, um, and I said, name a background. Bobby back. Bobby Vance. What is your background originally, religiously? I was raised Jehovah's Witness. Oh, we need we need some excellent. Okay, what about your wife? Baptist. Okay, good. That rounds it out. That's what we're missing. All right, that rounds it out. So, um, and that's what it is. It is this this, and, and we bring what we are with us and lay it out there for everybody, and it's all good. All right, everybody. I see some of you tomorrow. Be safe and well. And next time, Jesus is an enigma. Bring your thoughts with you. Bring your thoughts. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.